Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. I'm delighted to welcome you all in this risk and management webinar. My name is Alba Kecha, the account manager for risk management in PCB and the organizer of this webinar as well. Today's topic will be on ISO 27001 Enterprise Risk Management, which will be presented by Dr. Michael Redmond, the CEO and a lead consultant of Redmond Worldwide, an international consulting corporation. She is an international consultant speaker and author. Dr. Redmond's certifications include two master level certification in business continuity. To find out much more and ask your question related to the topic, today's webinar will cover the following. The latest revision of the standard, uh, learn how to apply ISO 27001 using a top-down risk-based approach and that is technology neutral, what ERM includes, etc. Before Michael begins her presentation, I would like to ask the audience to please write down any questions you may have during the webinar in the chat box on your control panel and we will respond to a few of them at the end and answer to the remaining through email. Thank you very much. Ma Michael, you may start the presentation. Great, thank you very much. Welcome everyone. Uh, one of the things is that I think is important is so the ISO 2701 is one of my favorite ISOs. Uh, I'm certified in a number of them and what I love about it is it actually covers so many areas that can be applied to the entire enterprise, not just information risk management. If you decide to reach me afterwards, uh, this is my contact information. I will encourage you to connect with me on LinkedIn. It's under Michael C. Redmond at LinkedIn, or you can see my LinkedIn address there. Uh, if you need to reach me, you can reach me at www. Uh, my email is address uh, website is www.redmondworldwide.com, or uh, you can reach me through LinkedIn. It's the best way to contact me. So what are some things to consider? When we talk about personal health information, PHI, payment card information, and personal identifiable information, the reason that these are the one I picked out the most prevalent are when you're protecting your information security, these are the areas that most companies are worried about being breached. I did not add in some other areas that you may also want to consider, such as any research you're doing, anything that you as a corporation consider important information that you would not want to get out to a competitor. Those are also considerations. The first thing you'll want to think about is how are you penetratable? Remember, it's not just a matter of breach from someone outside. It could be someone in your, in your own organization. It could be people being careless. There are many different ways. ISO 27035, Incident Response, tells you how to respond if you are actually breached, if you have an effect. And with incident response, the pre-planning is the most important part. I've done planning for a number of different corporations for incident response. Uh, I've done work for uh, one company in particular that was breached after we did the incident response planning. They found they had been breached actually two years prior to uh, their researching it and finding out if any of their database had ever been breached. Now fortunately, all of their information was encrypted. But nevertheless, they still had to contact their customers, they still had to see what was breached. And the incident response was so perfectly put together, utilizing ISO 27035 as well as others, we were able to already have pre-written different press releases. So the press releases went out effortlessly, this company was only in the newspapers for three days. Actually, very little negative press except asking why they waited 30 days to respond. Well, the truth is they did not wait 30 days to respond. They waited 30 days to tell the public. So part of your incident response is to pre-decide how long you're going to wait to tell the public. And part of that is, if you are breached, you may not want to tell the attacker that you know that you found something. You may want to go through and find the signature of the attacker. Who attacked you? Who is going to attack you again? So these are some considerations. So cyber attacks happen every day. They cause loss of reputation. And some companies are actually, 
the customers are afraid to come back into them. Uh, in the U.S., we had uh, different situations such last year, such as Sony, such as Target. There have been uh, breaches of different governments overseas. There have been uh, a number of different companies uh, that have found that their websites were tampered with, and someone actually left jokes to show that they had actually been on their website. So there's so many different types of attack other than just getting information. Some of them are just malicious. So the question is not if you're going to be the potential victim of cyber attack, but when. Many individuals ourselves have found out that our banks were affected or our credit card company and many people around the world have received letters telling them that it's possible their information was breached. And people used to get shocked and worried about it. What's happened is it's happening so often that companies are just sending out the letters, offering people as much as two years of free monitoring for certain corporations. And people are just, okay, it's fine, I was breached. The, we're accepting it more than we should be. So let's look at ISO 2701. It covers the Information Security Management System. Now I've broken that into what does legal have to do? What does physical and security have to do? And physical security is very important. As I said, it could be somebody internal. It doesn't mean that they have to be accessing the information through the internet, through other means. They could actually be just coming into your office. So what are areas that are there? What are the technical controls you have in place? So you want to make sure that you have written policies. And I say policies in plural. You want to have policies for authentication, policies for access control, policies for what information is allowed to be shared. You want to make sure that you've covered what your organization considers acceptable levels of risk. Now, the reason I say acceptable levels, some companies don't want to put so much controls in place because they're concerned about the fact that it may affect how they work and may slow things down. It's up to the company to decide how much you're willing to risk and what you're willing to risk. Now, originally, in the ISO 2701 version 2005, which is the old version, you had to do plan, do, check, and act. Planning was designing the ISMS, the Information Security Management System, accessing information, how you did your security risk, and all of your planning. The doing was actually implementing it. Checking it as your audits, it's checking your metrics. Does it work? Does it not work? How many people were breached that we were aware of? How many were breached that we took, took us how long to find out? We didn't know it for a month or two months. So these are metrics. You want to make changes where necessary to bring it back to peak performance. Now, I'm not saying that the Plan Do Check Act is not still viable. It is. However, under the 2013 version, which is the most recent, you no longer have to do PCDA model. They are also accepting Six Sigma or DMAC, whichever you prefer to use. So it's up to your organization to decide which of the processes to follow. So there are some key risk factors. I mentioned earlier that it's the people more than technology. Many of the errors that happen are people giving out information by mistake. There was a situation that happened where letters were going out to past employees, retirees, and someone inadvertently did something with the database and people's social security numbers in the U.S. went out on the address labels. It's a human error. Employees have to have security awareness training, and ISO 2701 goes through in depth how to do the security training, how to make sure you have everyone trained in place. So there's awareness training, how to do testing. 
Remember, it's only as strong as its weakest link. Now, I, I mentioned before, it's a, your risk appetite of your organization may be different than someone else's. You want to make sure the cost you're prepared to pay for. There's a lot of SIM software out there that you can incorporate that will tell you, it will give you an alert when someone is trying to breach you. It will do logging for you so you can actually go through and check if there are patterns coming in. Are they trying to get into a specific database? There is a cost to each of the SIM software. So not everyone is willing to implement that. You can also do cybersecurity incident response planning ahead of time. Most individual companies are not prepared to do it on their own because there are so many nuances that have to come in. They want to bring a consultant in that has experience working with different types of corporations that have done incident response for cyber attacks in the past. It could be denial of service attack. There are many types it could be, and they want someone who knows how to look at that. So that, again, has a cost. This is a continuous process. So what's your risk framework? Well, this is what you can do right now, today. You can understand what it is you need to protect. What information does your organization feel is important? Aside from the information you may be aware of, pub PHI, PII, are there areas that they're worried about espionage, someone finding out from another organization what you have. You need to know where that information resides, what databases is it in, what, what applications are you looking at. You need to know what's most important to protect. From a risk management point of view, you want to assess your risk and develop appropriate risk treatment plans. Part of those risks are not just what might be come in or where you might be attacked. But areas of weakness, are your people properly trained? Do they understand how to know that they're being attacked? Do they know the signs? Are they logging properly? This is part of risk management. You'll want to be able to monitor and assess that things are continuously improving. You're going to have to do metrics. Metrics are usually a percent or a number. What are the number of departments that have been trained out of the number we expected to have trained? What are the percent of people that pass their awareness training versus the number of people that didn't? So percent and numbers are a great way to assess. Governance. Senior management has to govern the risk management process. That doesn't mean that they just say, okay, this is great. They have to be aware. They have to approve. They have to set up a budget. So the ISOs work together. You have 27001 compliance, 27005, which is great for risk management. We spoke about ISO 27035, incident response. And you'll also want to know HIPAA, PCI DSS, all of the different other standards. They work together. You can't do one in a vacuum. They all merge. So ways to do that is to work with your compliance areas, work with your auditors, work with management, what's most important to them. The process for doing this that you want to do first is you want to identify the assets that are most important to your organization. And think about threats that could compromise those assets. Now, when I say estimate the damage, I'm not talking about, well, we've had a database. It's going to take us this many hours to put it back so that we can make sure it's secure again. I'm talking about the financial aspects of it from a point of view of being sued, regulatory liabilities that you incur. If your insurance is going to be going up, if you have cyber insurance, will your cyber insurance go up? because you've been attacked, because you weren't prepared properly, because it took you so much money to get back to normal operation to secure. These are all the estimates of damage you'll want to think about. But you'll also want to think about 
the qualitative loss of reputation, loss of customers. Both of those are estimating the damage. For instance, what would losing a trade secret pose to your company's financial well-being? If you happen to be a fragrance company and you have a brand new fragrance that's coming out, and you've already put all the advertising together, all the publicity together, and everyone's waiting for this to come out, and someone gets that information and they can make a duplicate copy of your fragrance perfume, at a third of the cost, you've lost a lot more than just a trade secret. You've lost reputation, you've lost future finances, you've lost a major product. You've lost your lead in the market. So you want to look at various entities that pose threats to your company's well-being. They could be hackers, disgruntled employees, careless employees, competitors. Disgruntled employees, if you see that you have an employee who's coming in working many hours when they never did before and your office is currently having layoffs, you need to monitor that person. If that person's coming in at midnight and their hours are 9 to 5, why are they there at midnight? Why are they accessing the system at odd hours? So these are things you'll want to look at. Careless employees is training and knowing who your competitors are and what would they want, what information do you have that would be important to them. We talked about identifying assets, but special attention to those that are most critical. And again, I know I mentioned database. A database itself is has information within it, but if you're breached and you find out that, and this has happened to a number of companies that were breached and found out that certain servers were hit, they didn't know it was on those particular servers. They, yes, they knew that they had uh, this amount of information, that amount, but they didn't know the contents per se. What was in that? database, what information was in there that was so vital. So you'll want to be able to go through and do your risk assessments, assessing which information you want to protect, not just from a disaster recovery business continuity point of recovery point of view, saying this is tier one because we need this application or this database is within 24 hours, 48 hours. You want to say, if this is attacked, can we wait a while to find out who's attacking it, or do we need to stop the attack immediately because the information they're getting is so vital? This is something you'll have to decide ahead of time. You want to consider all assets from automated systems to your paperwork. Paperwork is part of information security. Companies are forgetting that. There's a reason that companies install clean desk situations where people had to leave no papers on their desk at night. But if someone's drawers are not locked, or the file cabinets aren't locked, it's really not protecting the information at all. And who should have access to it? There have been companies where people took information that uh, new applications and people's personal information on it. They took it down to be photocopied, left the photocopies there while they were running, Anyone would have had access to them. So part of your risk assessment is to decide what your weakest links are. Are they the people? Are they your systems or your processes? Where do you have to shore up your operations? So you want to make a list of possible vulnerable targets. And I'm going to give you a second to copy some of these because I think that they're important. So the ones that I would look at are your engineering drawings, of course, your patent applications, things that you may not be considering as much. So you want to assign numeric values to those risks. Similar to business continuity or disaster recovery when you have tier one, tier two, tier three. Is this a, a tier one risk, tier two risk? What's the level of it? How important is it? High, medium, low could also be a value. But you want to 
make it determine how much time and money to invest in protecting it. And there are many different formulas for doing this, and I'm not going to go through that today. Uh, ISO 27001 certainly breaks down uh, some of the formats to go through that. There are uh, others that you can find available. But you'll need to be able to assign values to it. So you, when you look at it, you know this has to be protected. And that it's a common knowledge with all of your, your SOC, your cybersecurity people, that they're aware of what you're looking at. So you want to look at the risk and impact. What's the likelihood, probability, that something might happen? Breach, I can tell you right now, it has a very high likelihood. Very high likelihood. What is the impact? How much damage is going to be done to your organization if a loss does occur? And again, we talked about quantitative and qualitative, deciding between the two. So risk is the probability times the severity is going to give you your actual risk numbers. Or the likelihood times the impact. What is this, is it possibly a four or a five? I rate them one to five. I multiply my likelihood or probability times my impact severity. And that gives me the numbers that I should be looking at the most. So FEMA is the failure mode effects analysis. It's the likelihood that a threat is acted on independent of your precautions against it. It doesn't matter what you've done and you say it doesn't make a difference, we're prepared for that. What is the possibility that someone is going to try to breach you, to do a denial of service? then times the anticipated damage, then times the effectiveness of your controls in place. This gives you your failure mode effect analysis. This tells you where you can feel a little more secure and where you need to feel very insecure and what areas to work on. This is probably the most important slide we've covered so far. Likelihood of the threat is acted on times the anticipated impact, times the effectiveness of your controls, FEMA. Uh, at this point in time, you still have a few minutes. I do want to go back to one slide first. I'm sorry. I want to go back to the slide for a moment and go talk about this for a while. Within this slide, what we've covered is a summary of everything we've spoken about. The likelihood is based on looking at what's happened to other industries, other countries. And you may say, well, it hasn't happened here yet. Yet is not a good word. What you do want to look at is what is happening around the world. We've seen breach. We've seen a lot of denial of service. We've seen attacks coming out by teenagers just because they want to. Now, what's interesting about the teenagers is in some countries, if the teenagers are under a certain age, they're not prosecuted for cyber attacks. They're not put in prison. They're not really punished. I'm not saying they should be punished. It's up to your interpretation. But the controls are not there to stop the individuals from a legal point of view. So some countries now have started to say anyone doing cyber attacks will be treated as an adult, regardless of their age. So that's an interesting thing to know. So where are your threats coming from? Uh, there was one college recently that had two denial of service attacks that lasted up to three days each. It happened each time around the time that they were going to be having their exams. It was believed it was a student. The FBI was brought in. They never found out who did it. They were hoping for a third time so they could be more aware of it and be able to find who the perpetrator was, but they didn't. There was no third attack. But then other schools started having something similar. So once it's done in one place, it will probably be done in another. So the anticipated damage, the impact, again, I encourage you to look at the financial impacts, 
as well as the qualitative. The qualitative is just as important, and it's important to explain that to all of your personnel. The way that you're viewed, you know, Sony, it didn't affect Sony stock when they were their emails were breached and such because it didn't affect the individual. But a bank being breached in your account, it's just as easy to go right across the street to another bank that has better secure. And you may not do it the first time. You may forgive the bank the first time that they're breached. The second time, you don't forgive them. So it's important to know that it's not just a matter of preparing, but it's a matter of how they do the cybersecurity incident response. If they had dealt properly with the response by dealing with their customers, explaining that they have done the following precautions and that they're working very carefully by having conferences where they actually allow not only the press to come to a press conference, but have something similar for customers to come to who want to feel comfortable or have pre-training for customers on what they can do to protect themselves. Are customers going on, and all of it again is, is in uh, 27001, are customers going on websites that are, and not making sure that it's not a, that they're not clicking on phishing emails? Are they looking at making sure that that website is actually the website they're expecting to go to? Are you doing training for your customers not to click on certain links? Training your customers is very important, and identifying who all of your stakeholders are is critical. Because your stakeholders are your customers, your investors, but also your vendors. You may not know the company Target if you're not in the U.S., but they are a, a store, and they were breached through their HVAC, HVAC uh, vendor who had access to some of their systems to work on the systems, and they themselves were breached, and that is how they got into Target's systems. And that is how Target's customers' credit cards information was taken. So this is a long slope in, but because there's targeted types of attacks, there's different types of attacks. It's important to know which they are, how you're measuring it, to work with your cybersecurity people, to bring in specialists, to work with different areas. We talk about the effectiveness of your controls and mitigating your risk. If you're not doing penetration testing, you really don't know how effective your controls are. One of the things I do for companies is I will come in and I'll manage the penetration test. I'm not the person that's going to sit there and do the technical work to break into the systems. But I'll manage the people who are doing that. What type, what should be tested? I'll find out ahead of time what information wants to be protected, what information we don't want testers testing on to make sure that we can actually work in different scenarios. So we have well thought out controls. Now, if you're interested in any of the things that I've covered today, if you go to my LinkedIn page, I have 34 different articles that I've posted on my LinkedIn page on Michael C. Redmond, and I've covered some of these articles more in depth, and we will certainly, PECB, I, I teach for PECB, I teach their 27001 class, and I think it's important to take the certification classes, and I don't teach through PECB because there's nowhere else to go. I teach for PECB because they're the best. And I'm not giving them an ad, I'm simply saying why I'm with them. So I do encourage you to look at taking ISO 2701 certification training, even if your organization does not want to become ISO certified. The individuals having the knowledge will help you tremendously. With that, I'm going to turn us over now for questions. Thank you, Michael, for this highly informative webinar. We have some questions here. I will go with the first one. Uh, so the first question is, uh, we have implemented ISO 9001. Can some of it be used for ISO 27001? 
Absolutely. Part, that's why I said oh, many of the ISOs cross-reference each other. So yes, portions of that will absolutely apply. And as you're going through, you'll be able to um, do a mapping between them on which areas apply. But yes, if that information is already in there, it would certainly apply. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, how often should we perform a risk assessment or do we have to apply as an ongoing process? Risk assessment is supposed to be done a minimum of once a year. It is also supposed to be done every time you have a reorganization. It's supposed to be done every time you bring a new product or service in. But there's, you should still be, that's a formal risk assessment. But you still should be looking at your risk as an ongoing process, even though it's not your formal where you're filling out forms, you're doing questionnaires, you're doing interviews and surveys. But you do want to make sure that it is risk awareness is an ongoing process. The risk assessment itself, where you're doing surveys or interviews, are based on what, I, what the areas that I said. Thank you. The next question is, what should I include in my risk assessment? Uh, in the risk assessment, you're going to want to include uh, areas that you consider most critical, PII, PHI, what data is most critical. You're going to want to include how you are protected currently. What controls do you have in place? Are those controls good enough? Sometimes that's called a risk early warning indicator. Are you prepared to deal with those? Where are you weak? Are there certain ports that are not protected? Uh, are there areas that will be more accessible to be able to get into? What areas are easy to attack or breach? Uh, are you looking at the uh, what areas do you feel might be targeted the most? Uh, looking at uh, events that are happening around the world to other organizations, other companies. It's, a, it's hard to summarize the entire risk assessment in a few sentences, but those are the key areas. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we will go with the next question. Um, actually, it's a comment. Uh, it's, he's saying that, could you please make available the list of assets or mention some of them at least? Well, this is going to, this, uh, uh, the list of assets, I can get that. The list of, I'm sorry, assets? Yes. Well, the list of assets depends on your organization. But you want to look at your PII assets, your PHI, your uh, PCI. Those are the key ones you want to look at. And then you also want to look at what your executive management considers critical information. And those are the main assets you'll be looking at. As well, and then with it, what paper assets include that information. So those are the key areas. Thank you. We will go now with uh, two more questions. Uh, does ISO 27001 have to be implemented throughout the entire organization? No, you can do part of an organization or you can do the entire organizations. Uh, it seems that most organizations are doing one area first, concentrating on that uh, as a, the area they consider most important, and then uh, bringing other areas in. Or they may only do one area and not do the rest of the organization at all. Thank you. And we will go now with the last question for today's session. Uh, the question is, can, you, can security clearance reduce or eliminate, eliminate, eliminate the attacks on system? You say security clearance? Yeah, can security clearance reduce the attacks on system? I'm sorry, when you say security clearance, are you talking about uh, an individual having a security clearance to work on the systems? Probably yes, because uh, the, the okay. yes, it's yes. If somebody has a security system, it just means security clearance, it, it certainly helps you realize that they've never done anything in the past and that they, uh, a security background, they're checking to make sure the person has never done anything, that they're not currently in debt, that there aren't reasons that they may want to have information. It doesn't guarantee that it's going to be effective. Uh, it, it's it's a, a nice step. I do recommend having uh, background checks on everyone that's going to have access to your information. Everyone. But again, it, it's just telling you nothing has happened in the past. It's not a guarantee. 
We have one more question. Uh, he's saying that risk management is a part of ISO 27001 implementation. Then why a separate set of standards is, is, is established? Is it incomplete or limited in ISO 27001? Good question. Uh, 27005 takes it to a much higher level, uh, much more in-depth, because ISO 2701 is not only about risk management, it's about putting together your entire program. So it's taking a subset of it out and, and doing uh, more intense risk management work in 27005. Thank you, Michael, for this very excellent webinar. And I want to thank all the attendees as well who have taken time of their busy schedule to participate. I hope you all have learned something new today and your questions have been answered. This webinar is also recorded and can be found on our PCB YouTube channel. So don't forget to check back on our upcoming webinars on topics of your interest. I'm looking forward to seeing you all next week. Until then, have a great week. Thank you. Thank you very much.